Hi, welcome to Moments with Marilyn. I'm your host, Marilyn Boyer, the mom of 14 homeschool kids who love the Lord and love each other. I absolutely love young moms, and it's my privilege and my passion to share with you tips and tools to make your journey easier. Today, we're going to actually answer a question that one of um, our listeners asked me. She wanted to know how to deal with rowdy boys. So our topic today is dealing with boys rowdy and otherwise. And, you know, I grew up in a family of girls, never having much close exposure to boys. And Rick and I started our family, sure enough, we had the first boy grandchild of both sets of our parents. And I remember thinking, wow, what do I do with a boy? As a matter of fact, we had four little boys in a row, all 18 months apart from each other. When our oldest son was just three months old, we began attending a Sunday school class, and, and the teacher talked about internalizing scripture. And this was something new to me. I was a brand new Christian myself, and I'd never heard anything like this. So I sat there like a sponge. I was soaking up all these practical Bible teaching, and then I would write it down, and I'd try to find a way to communicate those scriptural principles to my new little son, even though he was pretty little. So I began to hang Bible verses all around his room and our living room and started learning what character was and looked for fun ways to teach it to my little boys. I'll be eternally grateful for that class because it channeled my focus away from academics to what I believe should be a priority in the training of little boys and girls as well. You know, as I look back, I see that God takes open hearts, even if they're ignorant hearts, and he blesses them. It's just seeking to do what's right, and God will do that for you. You know, you don't have to know everything. You don't know everything. God kind of guides us as we go. So first of all, scripture and character training should be priorities in training your boys and all your little ones. Early on, Rick recorded the book of Proverbs for our kids and stopped and explained difficult words and told example stories to help the boys remember. And they do, I mean, even to this day. It's one of those things we did to build a godly focus in our kids and would play the recordings at bedtime and nap time and they learned tons of scripture without even trying. And this was something we did with all of our kids. We did it for years. It didn't take very long before you could start a verse in Proverbs and they could finish it. And then Rick began recording other portions of scripture for them as well. And we have some of those available at Character Concepts. I'll put a link in the show notes. But It's one of the best things we did to lay a foundation for scriptural training for our kids, which is what every child needs. So during the day, we began focusing on character training. I would read to them from books, some of which are not even in print anymore, Child's Guide to Character Building, trying to teach them what godly character meant. And I asked God to show me creative ways to teach it to them. Many of the specific ways that we came up with are in our book, hands-on character building, and it's just got hundreds of projects that we used to teach scripture in a practical way to our kids, and it just, I mean, it was kind of, um, I felt like God would reveal to us ways that we could take the word and put it on a child's level so that they could understand it. So we began having our kids do these projects, and then we used finished projects to teach them God's word on a daily basis. And I won't go into a whole lot of that now, but I've got pictures in this book of some of the things that we did. We did wall hangings, we did a Jesus plaque, we did character quality quilts, Bible story curtains, um, plates to teach them the meaning of their name, wall hangings placemats, t-shirts, all these kind of things to teach our kids character, as well as things like obedience exercises and fun games that we would play to help them to internalize the word. So you'll find all that in that book. But, you know, I found that little boys especially are very busy, and they need lots of opportunity to run, jump, and romp. And dad always seemed to bring this out in them. During the day, they'd often sit, and I would read them stories, and we'd do the fun projects and and training and teaching. But when dad came home in the evening, they were inspired to get rid of any energy they'd stored up after their busy day. They loved to run and jump on him, wrestling around, screaming, and making lots of general racket, which was a bit too much for mom's taste. I used to say, quiet down, quiet down, and nobody paid attention. 
But you know, I began to realize that physical romping with dad and each other was something boys needed to do. Also early on, we, needed, we began to involve our little boys in learning to do chores, working in the garden, helping daddy fix stuff that broke, generally just being involved in sweeping the floor and home chores and serving others. And this all helped to build a strong work ethic in them. Each child was assigned chores from the time they were about three years old. And that sounds little, and sometimes you've got to go back and straighten it up and, and um, you know, add a little more effort to, to their effort. But it is so good to start early and train your kids to be responsible, to be a part of the family workforce. It is so important for all your kids, but especially for boys. We chose not to involve our kids in a lot of outside activities, play dates with other kids and things like that. That's kind of in fashion right now to do that. And I'm not saying they're bad. I'm just saying having so many kids coming so close together, it was hard for me to manage. But instead, you know, I tried to train them to be responsible, first of all, in the atmosphere of their home. As they grew older, we would lead them in projects of service to others in the church and the community, instead of focusing on artificial activities to please themselves. Now, I'm not saying that we never did fun things. We did. You know, we'd take trips up to the mountains. We'd take our kids to the beach. Um, you know, we would do things for them to have fun. We'd invite other families over for them to play. But our focus was not on entertaining yourself. It was on serving others, and it made a huge difference. Our family grew fairly quickly, and opportunities to serve in the context of the family were plentiful. And I would involve my kids. You know, when they were real little, I'd have them get diapers for the baby or throw a diaper in the trash or um, close the open door as they walked by, whatever. They need to be busy. Learning to be productive helpers builds within them a sense of being needed and the character of responsibility and diligence. You know, it's when your sons are little that you begin to build these godly disciplines into their lives. It's while little boys are small that we teach them to have a respect for girls and for women and for elderly folks. Little boys need to learn that God has special requirements for them to learn to be useful and how to develop the skill of making wise choices and looking for needs that others may have so that they can learn to be of service to them. Also, boys need to be encouraged to try new things, experiments, building, etc. As our boys reached, oh, I don't know, seven or eight years of age, we'd supply them with wood and nails and let them try building things, bookcases, birdhouses, chicken houses, tree houses. You know, boys need the freedom to try, and if something fails, that in itself is a valuable learning experience. Our sons would try experiments with plants, ways to train their animals, creative ways to do things. I remember my six-year-old Tim mowing with his dad's supervision, and he was a natural from an early age. He loved machines. But we gave him the freedom to fix things that would break. I still have a picture of him in, his, in my mind, him standing there with his little toolbox, saying, Mom, does anything need to be fixed? And at the time, we had these cedar kitchen cabinets, and cedar's a soft wood, and the doors would fall off, the hinges. So we'd let him fix that. You know, we would, our house may not be perfect, but we would let our kids, our boys, work on things that needed to be done in the house. So they would learn how to fix things. And even folks at church, we would ask them, you know, if you've got a broken blow dryer or a mixer, bring it to Tim. If they were going to just throw it away anyway and buy a new one. And if he could fix it, he earned a few dollars. If not, it gave him a valuable learning experience and nothing was hurt. But we would let him tear it apart and see if he could fix it. Sometimes just a wire had come attached or something, and he could fix it. And he just he had a natural propensity toward that. So you, you need to let your kids do that. You need to let them explore things and try things. We even let them try things that we knew wouldn't work, like keeping plants in the dark to see if they would grow or planting soup, as our little four-year-old son tried one time, Plant, or dumping his bowl of soup in the, in the dirt to see if it would grow soup. You know, little boys are messy and noisy, yet they've got a charm of their own. 
I remember my boys would spend hours in our garden after all the crops had been gathered in, creating towns with churches, homes, post offices, stores, roads, and fancy houses. They would name their villages and things, and they, they had fun. They had hours of fun. They would come in very dirty, but it was a healthy kind of play. We did not raise our boys with TV or video games. They had lots of great books, puzzles, tools, trucks, and materials to learn, explore, and create with. Artificial entertainments were few, and we wanted it to be that way. And we learned that our kids learn to think creatively. It's so much more healthy. If kids are brought up with too much screen time, they've just got all these images changing. It, they've got short attention spans. They're used to sitting and being entertained, and the screen changes to hold their attention. But if your kids are, have limited use of that, they will learn much more naturally to think creativ creatively. And that's what we saw in our kids. It's just too easy to plop down and watch something. But if it's not an option, wow, the mind begins to think and explore, and a whole new world of learning is opening, has opened up to them. You know, I loved raising my boys. I still love my boys. It's wonderful now to see how they still love their families. They're each other's best friends. But just if you're struggling with the special challenges of raising boys, just remember you are investing your time in raising tomorrow's leaders. As I look back on my time of raising boys, and I now have six adult-aged sons, I see how God perfectly designed the character traits and personalities into each one of them to prepare them for the role he planned for them to assume when they would be adults. So don't neglect the training aspect either. It doesn't come naturally. We would train our boys to have self-control. Sometimes they don't know that they can actually be still. So I would call a quiet time, sometimes just to survive because things were loud and rowdy. I would say, okay, guys, for the next 15 minutes, it's quiet time, which meant they would grab a book or a puzzle and sit on the couch and be still, but not talk. We would also do that in the car. We would call a quiet time because even if everybody was being good, sometimes you're in the 15 passenger van, you've got all these kids and it's just, you can't concentrate. So I would call a quiet time. Guys, the next 10 minutes, it's quiet time. We would also train our kids how to act in different situations. For instance, in church, we would keep our kids with us in church, but we would play church and practice at home how our kids could be quiet and listen and be attentive in church. We played church. Yes, we did. And sometimes some of the boys would pretend they were the preacher and others would pretend they were the song leader. Or they would pretend their sister was the nursery um, leader with all her dolls in front of her. But yeah, we would play, play church. We would prepare our kids in advance how we expected them to act in the store. And I've got another whole podcast on this, but we found that if you will invest your time in training, you will, you will spend a lot less time correcting because kids don't just naturally know what to do. They don't know what you expect of them. They don't know how to be adults. You have to train them and teach them. We would have car voices and school voices and church voices, which meant lower the tone and not just be wild and crazy. Now, they need some times when they can go outside and they can yell. We would let our kids yell and holler outside, but not in the house. Teach your boys discretion, how to act in different situations, what's appropriate and what is not. And they need training in this because they don't know. They don't think about it. So you have to train them. Train them in manners. You know, we, we just expect our kids to know how to act mannerly, but it doesn't come natural. They don't know. You have to train them. So we ended up with six boys and eight girls. And as each child is different, so it goes with boys. My firstborn son was self-motivated. He loved to set his own goals and beat them. He devoured books. My second son, however, was very different. He was a hands-on learner, and books did not hold much interest for him in the early years. He was too busy. He grew up to be an extremely competent, coordinated boy who could learn to do anything from building to playing the piano. And right now, he's actually at our church doing a whole remodel project. I mean, he can do anything. 
I've had the quiet, compliant type, the extremely distractible but cheerful, the steady, playful type, and the logical, thoughtful thinker, as well as the struggling learner. One of my sons would start the school day with a griping attitude, and I found that just getting on his level and tickling him a little bit, playing around a little bit, helped to lighten his attitude, and then he was usually ready to buckle down and go back and get it done. You know, looking back, I think he was thinking of all the things he'd rather be doing than schoolwork. My really distractible son needed me to sit near him and keep him on track. It was easy for him to think of anything but schoolwork. It's not that he even disliked it. He was just so distractible. No noise or conversation or interruption of any kind escaped him. So I needed to be there to remind him what he was to focus on at the time. He had to be shown. I also had one who would have been labeled something. He was brilliant, but just not on the timetable that school prescribed. With all my children, I let them progress at their own rate in every subject. But this one son just could not grasp reading. The skill of decoding sounds with all the exceptions in the English language caused him to one day say, Ma, the guy who wrote the English language must add a pencil in one hand and a jug in the other. So I read his history, science, and literature to him. He was very quick to learn anything except the skill of decoding letters. He even could do parts of speech when I'd read the sentence to him. But he was probably around 12 years old when it clicked and he finally began to read. And then he could read actual really complicated subject matter. And he really, you know, some of my kids would read and forget it. When he reads something, he remembers it. He retains it and understands it. So there have been different types of learners, but some things about teaching boys have been pretty consistent. One thing is that boys have lots of energy, even the laid back ones. Almost every day, one of my more laid back sons would ask me if he could go outside, take a break, and jump on the trampoline to wake up his brain. And I'd say, yes, please go wake up your brain. And it worked. It's extremely hard for boys to sit for long periods of time. They just function better if you break up their time with exercise. When they were little, I'd let them stop their studies and play with Play-Doh play if it was raining outside. And they'd make cows with the little molds and then proceed to butcher them with their plastic knives. They just needed to do something active. I remember them quoting scripture verses while standing on their heads or pacing around the room. This activity actually helped them to think. For preschoolers, it's probably best to have like three 10-minute periods where you're teaching them academics instead of a concentrated book time for a half an hour. It doesn't work as well that way. Another thing about boys is their competitive spirit. And I always try to channel that into breaking their own time record or goal rather than letting them compare themselves to their siblings or somebody else. I had one son that loved to do puzzles, and he loved to break his record and do it faster than he did it yesterday. Another son loved to, he'd call it, beat his dad on, on getting his schoolwork done. His dad would correct his paper at night, and he loved to beat him, which meant he got the correct answers. Um, you know, they're created so uniquely, and some subjects that come naturally to one are a struggle to another. Therefore, comparing themselves to their siblings is like comparing apples to oranges. If one child has strengths in a certain area, he can cooperate by helping his brother in that area. Maybe his brother has strengths in another area that he can help him at. To cooperate in finishing means that they get freer sooner to get onto the afternoon's pursuits, which in our family were those areas of interests that each child had at the time, maybe building bookcases or a birdhouse or grafting a tree. Boys need to learn to appreciate each other's strengths without feeling inferior. Everyone's different. And forbear each other's weaknesses to carry out God's plan for each. So they, you need to teach them the combined forces to accomplish special projects that they have in mind. Boys are also inquisitive. I think it's part of God's plan for man to be the leader. They aren't afraid to set off in a new direction. And I tried not to squelch this trait, but just direct it in safe boundaries. We wanted our boys to have a love for learning and exploring. They just need to be taught discretion as they do it. Um, they also need the motivation for buckling down to learn. For handwriting, for instance, instead of just giving them exercises in practice writing, I'd have them do something important 
like write letters to the editor or a letter of gratefulness to somebody who'd impacted their life or a letter to a chamber of commerce in a town we were planning on visiting to find out about historical sites that were available. One of our sons even wrote to the president or senators and they received responses. We saved those letters, we've still got them. I remember our oldest son wrote to Ted Kennedy and shared the plan of salvation with him. He didn't hear back from him. But whatever you're teaching them, whether it's handwriting, math, science, or history, let them know why it's important and why they need to spend time learning the skill of excellence and pursuing it. If you can't give them a reason, reevaluate it and see if it's really worth their time expenditure after all. Teach your sons to be question askers, not question answerers, as the government schools do. We need to raise thinkers, not responders. Real men think and lead and guide others down right paths. Let your son know that God has prepared him to be a leader. In closing, I just want to give you some possible things that you can involve boys in. First of all, teach them to have a servant's heart. Make a game out of looking for needs in others and teach your kids to, to take the lead in meeting those needs. There's lots of ideas in our book, Character for Action, if you need some examples. But you've got to get them out of their own selfish realm. They need to use their energies to plan missions to serve others. I remember when our son Josh had leukemia, he was raking for elderly people. He raked to help for a senior missions trip. Our, one of our sons, when one of the ladies in our church became a widow, he went and installed motion detector lights for her. And he would get her, her um, outside furniture out in the spring and put it back in the fall, things that her husband used to do that she couldn't do by herself. He would um, snow for, uh, he would shovel snow for his next door neighbor even after he got married, um, he did it when he was a, a boy for our neighbors, but then when he got married, he would shovel snow for elderly neighbors near him. When you've got teens, have them invest in younger boys. Our oldest grandson right now has been taking his younger brothers fishing, and they love it. He fixed up the boat on this little farm pond, and he takes them fishing, takes them to do target practice. Let them invest in other boys. Let them start a business. Our son Tim had a bookcase building business when he was a teen. Our son Tuck made belts and sold belts to people, leather belts. One of our grandsons right now has a vending machine business. His dad helped him buy vending machines. He found places to place them and he goes and, and uh, mans those vending machines. And he has to keep the records and you know check on it, see when it needs more stuff. It's good for kids to have things to do to keep them busy. A couple of our grandsons now have joined the militia, the local militia. When your kids are younger, let them put on plays, skits, historical reenactments. Consider joining the search and rescue team. Hunting, a lot of our kids took the gun safety course, the hunting safety course. Dog training, that's a great thing for kids to learn how to train dogs. If you've got a pet, who doesn't want a, an obedient pet? Have them be involved with your church. And if we have a Christian school at our church and our kids would be involved with Christian school projects, helping out and helping raise money for the school, whatever. Painting props for VBS. Even when our kids were young, I didn't put them in VBS, but I would let them help um, prepare for VBS, painting props and stuff. Yard work, especially for elderly. Interviewing vets, and I've got a whole podcast on this, but it is so critical, especially, I would say it's especially important for boys, but I did it with my girls as well. Interview vets. We did a lot of World War II vets. Now we're working on Vietnam vets. Find some vets. Find some Iraqi war vets. Invite them in your home and interview them. It is so inspiring for boys to do this. Let them plan family events. Invite like-minded families over. Let the boys plan activities. Evangelistic endeavors. Once our boys planned a basketball um, party with the neighborhood boys, they invited them over and they assigned them, you bring chips, you bring drinks, and then they share the gospel. 
Have your boys read good books, listen to audiobooks, make good use of their time and not to be idle. Boys need heroes to inspire them to greatness. You know, the founders of our country wanted to be useful and productive. People like Francis Marion, John Mosby, let your kids learn about these people. And if you need help with that, Uncle Rick Audio Book Club, for $10 a month, they can get two audiobooks of their choice every month and learn about tons of inspiring godly heroes. Your boys need that. The heroes the world gives them are not real heroes. Let them help with political races. Even when they're young, they can man the polls, they can distribute literature, they can knock on doors with their parents if they're young or with their teens when they're older. Phone calling our grandson Luke for um, our congressman's race. He made over 3,000 calls in a couple months to help to raise money and to turn people out at the polls. Grafting trees, that's another thing one of our boys did. He loved doing that, like graft a uh, red dogwood with a white. A garden pond, we had a son that built a garden pond. Building bird houses, one of our sons did that. You can find out what size hole different kinds of birds need, like bluebirds, how far off the ground to raise the, the house, what kind of flowers you want to plant to attract the bugs that those birds like to eat. One of our sons raised guppies and he sold them to a local pet store. Discover what your kids have joy in doing and then find projects. Help them, help them invent projects to use their talents to serve and bless others. Writing a book, our book Legacies of Character, our most recently book that Character Concepts has done was written by my grandkids. And we interviewed World War II vets, we, we researched World War II vets, and then we wrote a book about that. There's another boy, Hunter Scott, and I'll put this in the show notes, who wrote a book, Left for Dead. And he was a young teen when he found out about the indie survivors and how the Navy kind of blamed the captain for not zigzagging. And he helped get the captain exonerated. Our own senator, John Warner, um, was actually involved in that, and Captain McVeigh was exonerated after he was already dead. But kids can do stuff like that. Kids can do important stuff. They can build things. They can plan events. They can make videos, build tree houses. One of our sons built a playhouse, a dollhouse for his sister. They can learn photography. They can care for animals. They could raise chickens, ducks, train animals, horses, dogs. Train a comfort dog to go around to nursing homes or the pediatric cancer ward. They can usher in church. They can sing in the choir. Our sons were involved with Habitat for Humanity with my husband, actually building houses for poor people. Let it be a treasure hunt to find needs of service. Just a couple weeks ago, I was watching four of my grandkids, and we made supper for a widower. We took it to him. He recently has had his toe amputated, so he's... It's a struggle to walk. So one of my grandsons went and got his mail and his paper. We moved a couple chairs around his room so he could get around easier. And we, we brought him supper. And one of the younger kids made him a picture. You know, involve your kids in serving others. It meant so much for him just to have a visit. Elderly people get so lonely. And your kids can learn so much. We've done widow dinners, veteran dinners. And you can find, about, find out about that more in character in uh, character in action, where we actually have pictures of widow dinners that we've done. And this is, I've just scratched the surface. Use creativity. Limit your kids' screen time. It stifles creativity. Involve boys in real things, serving real people, taking on real projects to bless others. Don't stifle their rowdiness. Just channel it so that it can be used as a conduit for blessing others. I hope that has given you some ideas of what to do with your boys and how you can channel that energy into being a blessing to others.